Shadow King, A Tale of the Sundering by Gav Forth. The most tragic tale from the time of legends tells of the fall of the greatest houses of the elves and the rise of the three kings, Phoenix, Witch and Shadow. There was once a time when all was order, now so distant that no mortal creature can remember it. Since time immemorable, the elves have dwelt upon the Isle of Ulfwan. Here they learned the secrets of magic from their creators, the mysterious Old Ones. Under the rule of the Everqueen, they dwelt upon the idyllic island unblemished by woe. When the coming of chaos destroyed the civilization of the Old Ones, the elves were left without defense. Demons of the Chaos Gods ravaged Ulfwan and terrorised the Elves. From the darkest of this torment rose Anarian, the first of the Phoenix Kings, the Defender. Anarian's life was one of war and strife, yet though the sacrifice of Anarian and his allies, the demons were defeated and the Elves were saved. In his wake the Elves prospered for an age, but all their grand endeavours were to be for naught. The warrior people of Nagarif found little solace in peace, and in time would turn upon each other and their fellow elves. Where once there was harmony, there became discord. Where once peace had prevailed, now came bitter war. Heed now the tale of the Sundering. Part 1. The Child of Kurnos, Strife in Nagarif, A Trailing Shadow, The Treachery of Malekith. Chapter 1. The Young Hunter In the days of the first Phoenix King, Anarian, the Defender, founded the realms of Nagarif in the harsh north of Ulthuan. Under his reign, the Nagarothi, as Anarian's people were called, studied long the art of war and forged a formidable army to defeat the demons of chaos. At Anlek, greatest fortress of the elves, Anarian held court with his queen, Marathi, and they brought into the world their son, Malekith. Anarian fell at the very moment of his victory, and the rule of Nagarif passed to his son. Prince Malekith formalised the promises of his father and secured the lands and wealth of the many princes who had fought by Anarian's side. Yet, ever a wanderer and warrior, Malekith departed for new walls in the colonies. Second only to the great Kalador dragon tamer in Anarian's esteem was Eoloran, Anar, the Phoenix King's standard bearer. To his stewardship, Malekith gave the land of the eastern Nagarif in the hills and mountains of the Anul. In Anarian and Malekith's name, Eoloran would rule, and there was peace and prosperity for an age. Eoloran was a wise prince, and was content to raise the power and privilege of House Anar without conflict, though he sent his son Eoflir to fight in the colonies for a time, so that he might know something of war. His wife having died in the war with the demons, Eoloran became reclusive, though always ready to answer the calls of the lesser nobles of Nagarif. Other, more ambitious princes, grew in renown and the deeds of Eloran faded from memory, except from within the halls of Elandris. With Malekith gone from Nagarif to conquer new realms for the elves, the seed was sown for division. Jealous of the power granted to Eloran, though he did not wield it often, Marathi wove tangled politics to isolate the Anars from the rest of Ulfwan, while all the while strengthening her grip upon Anlek and Nagarif. It was not a topic Eloran wished to discuss with his family, who were left to wonder what the ancient elf planned to revive his family's fortunes, or if he had any plans at all. He forbade any of the Nars from visiting Anlek, and instead was content to petition his fellow lords with letters reminding them of their support from the Anars in centuries past and their ancient vows to one another. Eloran's son, Eraifle, tried his best he could to maintain the status of House Anar, but he knew that there was a change coming. He could not define what it was that alarmed him. It was a flicker in the corner of the eye, a sound on the edge of hearing, a distant scent on the wind that cautioned him. It was the season of frost. In the 1042nd year of the reign of the Phoenix King, Bel Shinar. At the home of the Anars, the wind had turned north, and brought with it the chill of winter down from the mountains. 
Snow flurries drifted from the highest peaks in long, fluttering streamers of white. The furthest reaches of the pine forest were dusted with snow as the bitter weather crept down the mountainsides day by day. Mayeth was wrapped in a long shawl of dark blue wool as she stood in the gardens of the Anars maze. Alephle, her husband, placed an arm around her and smiled. There is a warm fire within. Why do you stand outside in the cold? he asked. Listen, she said. They both stood in silence, and the only sound to be heard was the sighing of the wind. Then, faintly, there was a call, the croak of a crow. A single crow in winter, said Eflair. A bad omen, do you think? Yes, she replied. Though no more an omen than a houseful of sudden guests come here from Anlek seeking sanctuary. It is but a temporary arrangement, said Eflair. One day Prince Malekith will return, he will reign in Marathi's excesses, we must be patient. Excesses, laughed Maeth, with bitterness, not humour. Butchery and perversion are not excesses. There are those who protect her, you know that, said Ethla. But there are many who see her rule as tyranny and resist her. When, demanded Maeth, pulling herself free from her husband's arms to stare at him. For many years they have done nothing. We have done nothing. She is the mother of the Prince of Nagarif, the bride of Anarion. It would be treason to move against her directly, said Ethler. For the moment it is sufficient that we rule our lands and keep them free of her taint. If she tries to take our power overtly, she will find greater resistance than she expects. And what of Farion, Fagrir, Lostef? and the others, who now sleep in our beds, afraid of to return to Anlek, asked Maeth. Are they not also princes of Nagarif? Do you realise that they once thought that Marathi would never be so bold as to go against them directly? What would you have me, a traitor and a usurper, snapped Aethla? Or worse, would you be a widow and your son fatherless? In Anlek, Marathi holds sway, but here, in the mountains, her reach is short. She may try to pick us off one by one, but as long as we are united, she cannot move against us. Fully a third of Nagarif's armies are abroad with Malekith. Another third owe allegiance to my father and his allies. Marathi cannot conjure soldiers from thin air, no matter her power of seeing and scrying. Your father holds half of the warriors in Nagarif, and yet what does he do, said Maeth with scorn. He hides here and writes letters. Are we not all sons and daughters of Nagarif? Our armies should be camped outside the gates of Anlek, demanding restitution from Arathi for the wrongs she has done our people. And what of Malekith, and Nairin's heir, our rightful ruler, said Ethler, grabbing his wife by the shoulders. Do you think he will look kindly upon those that raise arms against Anlek without his consent? Would he welcome those that threaten his mother? I tell you now, my father would die of shame to be thought of as a traitor, and so he rallies support in the only way he can. Hush now, said Maeth, quickly, embracing her husband. Turning, Aethle saw a young elf, no more than thirty summers old, walking down the wide steps from the mansion. He was dressed in hunting leathers, edged with dappled fur and bound with leather fronds and in his hands he held a slender black bow and a quiver of arrows. More practice, Aleph, called Aelethla, distangling his wife's arms. You already know that there is not a lord in the mountains that can match your eyes and eyes. I know nothing of the sort, father, said the boy somberly. Curion says that his cousin from Chase, Menehion, can strike a pinfowl in flight at a hundred paces. Kifrin says many things, my son, said Maeth. If we believe all he claims, then his cousins, all four of them, would be a match for any army in the world. I know that he exaggerates, said Aleph. However, I have made a wager with him to call his bluff. In the spring, I will contest with Maeth, and I shall uphold the honour of House Anar. Until then, I must practice further while the snows still hold back. Very well, but be back before dusk said Ethler. Aleph nodded, and walked away slinging his quiver over his shoulder. He knew that his parents thought him distant, morose even, 
They whispered and fell silent when he was around, but he was observant and keen-eared, and knew that all was not well in Nagarife. The mains was full of refugee princes, who had chosen not to support Marathi and her hideous cults. He also knew, perhaps even where his father and grandfather did not, that this matter would be settled not with diplomacy, but with force. He fought much of his family for avoiding direct confrontation with the rulers of Nagarife, but he knew that one day he would lead House Anar, and he was determined that the manner of the world in which he ruled would be better than that of today. Others would follow him, not out of fear, but out of respect. It was never too early to earn respect, though, often too late. Leaving the formal gardens through a silver gate in the high hedge, Aleph strode into the hills and heaped up higher and higher upon the shoulders of Cyril Anaris, the Mountains of the Moon. The whole mountain and its surrounds were, were the lands of the Anar, granted to Aleph's grandfather by Anarian himself. Though inhospitable in winter, they were abundant with game and fowl, and the lower meadows still made good pasturing for goats and sheep. These would be his lands one day, and so he walked them as often as possible, getting to know them as he knew the house where he had been born. Today he went north and east, along the inner Varif, the cold river, flowed down from the caves hidden upon the slopes of Cyril Anarus, and fed the lands of Elandris with fresh water until it disappeared back underground at the Hamath Falls, many miles to the south. Picking his way along the winding bank, Aleph watched the silver darting of fish in the clear waters, leaping and swimming through the rocky rapids. Needing to get to the northern side of the, of the river, the young elf leapt nimbly from rock to rock, heedless of the torrent sweeping past his feet, unmindful of the slick stones upon which he stepped. From here he found an old track that led further up the hills, twisting around dark boulders and leafless bushes. It was some time before he came under the eaves of the pine forest and set foot upon a frosted carpet of needles. Aleph's light tread left barely a mark in the crisp mulch as he broke into a jog, speeding swiftly under the overlapping branches of the trees. Aleph was guided by an inner sense attuned to the distant warmth of the sun behind the clouds. The wind upon his face and the subtle slopes of the ground beneath him, as clearly as if he had a map, he cut eastward through the woods, along the flank of the mountainside in the branches above, birds swooped to and fro while four-legged whiskered hunters snuffled through the patchy undergrowth, unaware of his passing. His route brought him to an outcropping of rock and pushed several hundred feet up through the trees, and at its foot there was a low cave. Cloud had flowed down the mountainside and swathed the clearing with a fine greyness that dulled colours and muted sound. Ducking inside of the gap in the rock, Aleph came to a wider cavern, dark but for the trickle of sunlight through the entrance. He reached out to his right and with hand came upon a torch of bound branches held within a scorn on the cave wall. He spoke a word, a spark lit within the torch head and swiftly took flame. With this light, he walked further into the cavern. The cave opened into a wide natural nave, shaped over thousands of years. Staglamites and stalactites had met in ages past, forming glittering pillars much like the columns of a grand cathedral. It was not just a temple in appearance, for Alav had come to one of the shrines of Kurnos, the Hunter God. The glow of the flickering brand danced across dozens of skulls placed in the niche around the cave wall, of wolves and foxes, bears and deers, hawks and rabbits. Some were gilded, others inscribed with delicate runes of prayers and thanks. All were gifts to Kurnos. Though worshipped much more in chase, whose hunters were renowned throughout Ulfwan, Kurnos was still acknowledged elsewhere in those communities that had not moved to the ever-growing cities. In Elandris, the hunter god was held in high esteem, the ways of the wilds not yet swept from with the formality of Azurian or the other gods. It was a feral shrine, with a dirt floor scattered with dead leaves. The walls were painted with hunting scenes of predators chasing prey. Some were ancient and faded, others were brighter and more recent. 
Aleph knew that others came here, though he had never encountered another hunter visiting the shrine. Aleph had no such grand offering this day. Though in the past he had fashioned such sacrifices for the wolf of the heavens, he knelt down before the altar, a rocky plinth strewn with twigs, ash and destrous. There was a hole bored into the rock where he set the torch, and then he gathered up a mound of broken sticks and dried leaves. Snapping a single brand from the torch, he lit the small fire and breathed in it into greater life. He spoke a few words of thanks and dropped the burning stem onto the miniature pyre. Aleph then pulled something from a pouch at his belt, a thin sil sliver of venison from the last deer he had slain a dozen days ago. He screwed the meat on a forked piece of branch and set it atop the fire where it hissed and spat. Aleph then crossed legs before the altar and took his bow across his knees. With his hands upon it, he whispered a few words to Conus, thanking him for the kill he had offered and asking for grace in his hunts to come. Head bowed, Aleph sat for a while longer in silent contemplation. He tried to put aside his worries and focus on the hunt to come. He pictured himself stood atop the peak of Cyril Anris, the sun bright upon his face and the wilderness laid out before him. He pictured the trails of the animals followed, the pools where they drank, the runs where they hunted. From within, the landscape of Cyril and Anris opened up before him. There were still many dark patches, places where Aleph had not yet travelled. After paying due homage, Aleph stood and left the cave, the venison still burning behind him. With another word of power, he quenched the torch and placed it back in its holder, ready for the next visitor. Him or another, it did not matter. Stooping low, Aleph ducked out of the cave and then stood frozen. Just ahead of Aleph, in the thickening mist, stood a stag. It was a monumental creature, its shoulders higher than Aleph was tall, with a spread of antlers wider than the young prince's outstretched arms. Its coat was white, save for a flash of black don its chest. The stag watched Aleph with deep brown eyes, neither aggressive nor alarmed. The young elf straightened slowly and started back. The stag bent its head and shook its antlers, scratching at the ground with a hoof. Aleph was convinced this was some sign sent by Kurnos, but could not fathom its meaning. The stag was becoming more agitated and arched back its head and let loose a long bark. Aleph took a step forward, his hand outstretched in a placating gesture, but the stag suddenly looked to the west and then bounded away into the forest. Aleph turned his gaze to where the stag had looked and saw a figure beneath the eaves of a tree. He was mounted upon a black horse and swathed in a cloak of dark feathers. The rider's head was cowled and nothing could be seen of his face. Unconsciously, Aleph reached for his bow and turned his head to grasp it from the quiver. As soon as he looked back, the rider was gone. Aleph strung an arrow and dashed across the open ground to the edge of the trees where the rider's horse had been. There was no mark upon the ground, the frosted pine needles undisturbed by foot or hoof. Two bizarre events so close together left Aleph feeling unnerved and he glanced around the rest of the clearing but could see nothing. Taking an arrow from his bow, he broke into a run and headed straight back towards the mains, although all through thoughts of hunting forgotten. The heir of House Anar chose not to share his two strange encounters with his family, who had enough to contemplate without the fanciful tales of their son. The experience faded in his memory over the winter and spring until even he was not sure whether it had truly happened or been some kind of waking dream. Thoughts of strange omens and mysterious riders were replaced in the young elf's mind with a more pressing concern, love. The day before midsummer, Aleph savoured the warmth of the sun upon his skin. He wore a short sleeveless gown of white silk his face, arms and legs exposed to the pleasant heat as he lay on his back, staring up into the cloudless sky. That it is not something I see too often, said Maev, sat on the grass hill next to her son. Behind them, the large mains of House Anar, capital of Alandris, rose up from the slope of the mountain, its white walls bright in the sunshine. 
Elves were gathering in groups around the gardens, talking and drinking, taking sweet meats and delicacies off trays from servants, livid in silvery grey. What is that now? asked Aleph, turning to his side and resting on one elbow. A smile, his mother replied, with one of her own. I cannot be sad on a glorious day such as this, declared Aleph. Blue skies, the glow of summer, these things cannot be touched by darkness. And, said Maeth, with an intent look at her son, there have been many such days this year, and yet I have not seen you this happy since you loosed your first arrow. Is it not enough that I am content, said Aleph? Why should I not be happy? Do not be so coy, my reticent child, Maeth continued playfully. Is there not some other reason for this unbounded joy? Something to do with the midsummer banquet tomorrow? Aleph's eyes narrowed and he sat up. What have you heard? he asked, returning to Maeve's gaze. Oh, this and that, his mother said with a dismissive wave of her hand. I met with Canfras just before I came up here. You must know him. He's the father of Ashnail. At the mention of the elf maiden's name, Aleph looked away. Maeve laughed at his sudden discomfort. So it is true, she said with a triumphant grin. I take it from your carefree happiness today that the smitten expression you've worn whenever Ashen has been around, that she has agreed to attend the dance with you. Aleph's face was one of concentration as he replied. She has, he said. Dependent on her father's permissions, of course. What, do you, what did he say to you exactly? Only that you run around in the woods like a hare and dress like a goat herd more than a prince, said Maeth. Aleph was crestfallen and moved to stand. Maeth leant over and steadied him with a hand of her own, and that he would be delighted for his daughter to court the son of the Anars, she added quickly. Aleph stooped and paused before breaking into a wide grin. He said yes, said Aleph. He said yes, Maeth replied. I hope you have been practising your dancing and not spending all of your time with that bow. Calabreth has been teaching me, Aleph assured his mother. Come, she said, standing up and reaching down a hand to Aleph. You should greet Canfras and thank him. She pulled her son up by the hand. Aleph stood hesitantly, eyeing the gathering elves as if they were circling a pack of ice wolves. He has already said yes, Maeve reminded him. Just remember to be polite. <laughs>